reading today is from Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 13. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, Pastor John. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing out there? Honk if you're uh, inside. How you doing? All right. That's a happy honk. That's not the Chicago honk. That's a happy honk. I like that. Well, I'm Pastor Chad. Uh, I've seen some familiar faces and I see some new faces. As Pastor John said, I've been here a couple times. I think the last time was November 2018. And since then, actually, we disappeared for a while because we moved up and we were interim pastors in Nome, Alaska. And if you want to just get out and Google that, that's way up in Alaska. We were closer to Russia than we were to any other major anything. But it was amazing. It was amazing to the point where Dan and I now travel the lower 48. So if you've ever been to Alaska, you know that everything down here is called the lower 48. And we travel the lower 48 uh, to support Alaska. I'm usually really loud. Do I need to hold it? No, I just have to. Okay. So that's what we're doing now. We're, we actually are out uh, traveling to churches and different, we've been all over, um, raising support for ministry to happen in Alaska, specifically youth ministry. But that's that's not what I'm here to preach about. But I just want to let you, that's what we're doing now. It's The name of it's called Kayak, Covenant Youth of Alaska. But, you know, in our travels, we've been traveling since June. We actually, we, we haven't been, we've been on the road since June, middle of June. This is our last stop before we go to our pseudo home called the RV for a couple weeks before we hit the road again. But it's interesting, as we've traveled, uh, the world is kind of strange right now. I mean, Sheboygan is kind of, this is kind of a nice, uh, it's been a nice, we've been here since, in the area since Wednesday, and it's been just kind of nice to just be able to relax and not have all this stress and pressure. But, you know, as, as the, the world's going the way it is, a lot of people are saying, where, where's God in all this? You know, let's, one thing about me, just so you know this, I'm the elephant in the room guy. I'm not afraid to say what a lot of people are thinking. You know, it's something about church where we all have to pretend like everything's great and we're all happy and joyful. And But the reality is, I mean, stuff's weird right now. It's crazy. And and it's kind of hard sometimes to find joy, that, that, that biblical joy in everything we're going through right now. I mean, we traveled, we were in Seattle, and we went and see, we went to see the area where Chop or Chaz, you know, where all that, that area, insane boarded up spray painted i mean there's some beautiful things there but it was just and then you know in chicago there's still boarded up buildings i mean just as we travel around the country it's just crazy and then you know the whole covid mess i've had five tests in the last month you know everywhere you go in some places it's if you don't wear a mask you're going to get shot some places if you wear a mask you're going to get shot i mean it's just it's just crazy and and you got to wonder you know this is crazy. Where's God in all this? Why is God allowing this to happen? And then I think about Alaska. I mean, I think about Alaska. And the reason I chose the job I did is because there are villages with churches without pastors, which is just seems crazy. Because, I mean, it's hard to find a job as a pastor down in lower 48. I mean, there's pastors without positions that have been waiting for years. But in Alaska, because of the lack of finances, there's churches without pastors, no less youth ministry. You got whole villages without any kind of pastoral presence at all. It just, it, you know, God is moving through that. But you like, God, did you forget about them? God, have you forgot about us? I mean, sometimes we, let's, can we be honest? Sometimes we wonder where God and all this stuff. 
But you know, here's the thing. Sometimes, as followers of Christ, it's easy to feel forgotten. You know, we go through crisis or tragedy or just, just life is tough. I mean, it's, it's easy sometimes to just feel forgotten. Like God isn't paying attention anymore. But you know, here's the thing. Biblically, you're not the first people to feel that way. I mean, I can go through scripture after scripture of scripture. I mean, think of the Psalms. Oh God, where are you? I mean, as I, I mean, there's so many famous Psalms about crying out for God and just feeling His presence and wondering if He's still there. I mean, Jesus in Gethsemane cried out, "Where are you, God?" You know, because He felt distant. You know, He felt distant for that that slight moment. But I want to go over a scripture, and it's Luke chapter one, five through sixteen. So. Bibles, apps, Bible app, whatever you got, if you want to follow along. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. Uh, I just stick with that because it's really easy. So if I'm going to a, a very academic church, they get the words. If I'm going to a very non-academic church, they still understand the words. I don't have to, you know, kids understand the words. Everybody understands it. So I love a version like that that's very accurate yet very understandable. So we're going to start in chapter 1 of Luke, verse Five, And it starts with this. When Herod was the king of Judea. Now you're thinking, wait a minute. I remember that. That's, that's like the Christmas stuff we talk about. Well, it's interesting because this story does get tied into Christmas, but it's so much bigger than Christmas. But when Herod was the king of Judea, when they wrote those words, it meant something different than what it means to us today. You know, we say when Herod was the king of Judea, okay, that puts us in the time frame, so we know that it was, you know, in a certain time frame. But to the original readers, that meant, holy cow. Because Herod was vicious. Herod was like Hitler of, of his times. I mean, he killed his wife, his mother-in-law, his kids. He was so scared that somebody was going to take over his reign that anybody that was a threat to him, he had killed. This is the same guy that you remember when Jesus was born, he had everyone two and under killed. Because he was a threat that Jesus may take his throne. This is the guy. So when they say in the times of Herod, people are going, oh. So they understand that. So let's go under that mindset. It says, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. So here we have Zechariah and Elizabeth. These are good people. I mean, these are godly people. If, if we were, we say that it's, it, it, it's Pastor John and his wife, and Lindsay. I mean, it's the good people working for Jesus, right? Living, the, trying to live a good life. That, that's who we're talking about here. And it says, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. I mean, they were doing what they could for God. But here's the thing. In those days, the you know we, we joke around about the perfect family is you know white picket fence, two and a half children and a dog. Their children were really important. It was status. It was it was important to have. It was like the Palestinian dream to be married with children. And if you skip ahead, I'm not going to go that far. But in verse 25, she Elizabeth, when she actually has a son, she says, "Thanks for taking the shame off of me." I mean, to not have children was such a big deal that she thanked God for taking away her disgrace. So, but here they are serving God, but not living the way they wanted to, not having that thing that they wanted the most, which was children. So, you know, let's go with, if we go with this in like number ones, uh, sometimes we feel forgotten by God when our righteousness or our good works go unnoticed. You know, maybe maybe you know what I'm saying. You know, you work so hard for God and, and stuff happens like, God, I, I mean, I do all this. I'm trying to live a life for you and, and this happens? Really, God? I mean, it's hard to find joy in those scenarios. You know, uh, it says in verse 7, they had no children because Elizabeth was unable to, unable to conceive and they both were very old. And sometimes things like that can blow a hole in our faith. Let's be real for a minute. You know, we're living this nice, godly life. We grew up in the church. We know all about God. And we follow Him. We do our Bible studies. We go to church. We go to Sunday school. We do all those things. We volunteer. We evangelize. 
But then something hits us and it can just blow a hole in our faith. I mean, maybe money difficulties hit. I mean, with COVID, a lot of people lost their jobs. I don't know where you guys are and this, what, what effect COVID has had on you guys, but a lot of people lost their jobs and they're struggling. It's like, God, what's going on here? Or maybe uh, just waiting for that perfect mate. I'll tell you, one of the biggest things that we found in Nome that caused the alcoholism was the lack of women. <laughs> Seriously, there was more men than women, and the men were so depressed because they couldn't find somebody to love. They couldn't find somebody to be with. I mean, and they struggled. Now, I don't know, maybe you're in that position, you're like, God, come on. I'm looking for that perfect person. Or maybe you just feel unconnected. You know, and, and in the world we live in currently, it was already disconnected a lot, let's be honest. Even as a church, we can kind of, we stay connected somewhat, but it's a disconnected world we live in. And now with quarantines and all this, I mean, we just feel like we're alone in this world. Or, or maybe um, there's some of you, whether here or, or listening online, that had the same problem as Zachary and Elizabeth. You wanted to have a child and you're just unable to have a child. Or like in our scenario, if you, re you recall, uh, those of you that know us, we lost our daughter Kylie and her fiance Jalen in a car accident, uh, 2016. And it's like, God, really? Really? I mean, where are you in all that? Or it could be just, you know, waiting for somebody in your family or a child to just come to Jesus. And you're like, God, you know, why, why is this not happening? There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that go on in our personal lives or our family lives that we're like, God, did you forget me? Are you out there? And we really sometimes can feel that all the righteousness, all the good works we do just become completely unnoticed. And then, you know, it, it goes on in verse 8. It says, one day Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. So if I were to say point number two, it's feel forgotten. Sometimes we feel forgotten when our faithfulness goes unrewarded. So here we go. We've got Zechariah has been serving. He's been serving faithfully for years, and he finally gets honored. Now this is a huge thing to get picked by lots to go into the temple. There's about 8,000 priests. And the odds of actually getting chosen to go in, and this is like the highest honor you could have, is to go into the temple. And he got chosen. So God chose him for that, but he's still without child. And this is something they prayed for, not just for years, but for decades. And it says, uh, while uh, the crowd stood outside, while the incense was burning, the great crowd stood outside praying. So here, Zechariah goes into the temple. He's being honored for his faithfulness, but at the same time, he doesn't have what they really desire. And if you read through the scriptures after what I go, you can see how much this child meant to them, how much that their life revolved around desiring and praying for this child. But sometimes we feel forgotten. Here's a big one. When time goes on unrelenting. You know, how many of you have prayed for something and not got an answer? I think we could all raise our hand to that. Sometimes it's because it's the wrong thing to pray for. But sometimes it's because God just hasn't answered it yet. I remember they prayed for decades. Decades for a child. Decades. And they never stopped praying. But they were very old. It says that in verse 7. They were very old. Now let me just tell you something. If you're listening on FM, you're here, you're on listening on YouTube. Whenever the Bible says very old, it means something really awesome is about to happen for that person. Whenever they talk about the age of that person, especially when they talk about this person was very old or up in their years, that means God's about to move in amazing ways. The, so... Side note, that means God's not done with you yet. God's not done with you until you're with Him. And then He's still not done with you. But, you know, sometimes we pray for things, and we know they're godly things, like praying for your child to become a believer. There's That's a real prayer. That's an But then you go on. I know families that have children that they're just it's killing them inside. Because their children won't come to Jesus. 
And that's a prayer. I mean, that's a biblical prayer. You're like, God, where are you in all this? Did you forget? And it just seems like time just goes on and on and on. You know, let's be real. Who has unanswered prayers? All of us. Or you're not praying. If you don't have an unanswered prayer, you're not praying enough. I'll just say that. You're not praying enough. But here's the thing. You know, I've learned this even more so. It means so much more to me that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We can't, we can't, we're not God. We don't know what he's thinking. We don't know what he's doing. But we do know one thing. He has the best in mind for us. And sometimes that delayed response is the best thing he can give us. You know, I remember, uh, just getting a little personal here, I remember the first week after we lost our daughter, well, after we lost Kylie, we did these like middle of the night, we didn't, we didn't sleep for days. And I remember saying, uh, my wife said, how much more do we need to give? I mean, we were very sacrificial in our ministry. We were working, we, it was just, it's like, we've given everything. How much more do we need to give? You're like, God, where the heck are you? But you know what? Here's the thing. Even though we feel forgotten, God is there. Joy can still be found in those moments. See, there's one thing about Zachariah and Elizabeth. They were righteous. They still found joy in those moments. Even though that unanswered prayer, even though they felt forgotten, you know, in James, this is a popular scripture. A lot of people know it. James chapter 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. See, Zach and Elizabeth found joy. They found joy in their answered prayer, which we're coming to. But, you know, as I've done a lot of thinking back and reflecting on the last three and a half years, I looked up some of the original things I wrote. I used to I used to write, and then I just started doing verbal blocks. It was just so much easier, and it got my emotions and feelings. But I found something that I wrote uh, in the first week. And it was, it was a post. I did a post on Facebook. I just did one to tell people what's going on, and I and I talked from a spiritual perspective of what God was saying to me. And this is what I wrote. This is the first week before the funeral. I said, when I looked on my phone and saw the overwhelming response to yesterday's post, I was torn with many emotions at once, memories, feelings of love. Then I ran across this post, Doug Kirchner, friend with Sean Browning. So this is a guy I didn't know. He's a friend of a friend on Facebook, and this is what he wrote to me. He said, Chad, I don't know you from Adam, but I found this posting and I'm sorry if you're lost. I lost my daughter five years ago, and since then I lost my faith. Big ups and downs with it. But reading your post gave me perspective, and I thank you for your heart. I grieve your loss, and I will pray for you. So here in our grief, this is what I wrote. Even reading it right now puts a little joy in my heart. God used something horrific horrific terrible something i would trade everything for in the world to change this guy's life doug and i are friends now doug has come back to jesus doug is he went back to school he went got his life back together and just from me being faithful and still talking about the holy spirit through all of this this guy came back to jesus he came back to jesus now, joy looks different. Here's the thing though. Joy looks different in struggles. Joy looks different in grief. Joy looks different in trials and tribulations. Uh, joy is not necessarily, let's go be happy and giggle and have fun. Joy means that we have hope. That we know that something better is coming. We realize that God is there, joy starts. When we just know that God is there. So in that moment, even though, let me tell you what, I wondered where the heck God was in all this. God poked his head out and said, look, I'm still here. I'm still here. In the scriptures, we go back to uh, the story of Zechariah. It says, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. So let me give you um, a a more modern version of that's that what just happened there. Boom! 
I mean, he's standing there and an angel shows up. Hello? He's in this place where no one goes into, except for very sudden. He's in there in a place that's supposed to be alone, and all of a sudden there's a person standing in front of him. It says, uh, Zachariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. Shaken and overwhelmed. See, he knew God was there with him. There was no surprise. There was no wondering. The uh, God's presence was felt. But the angel looked at him and said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. See, the next words out of his mouth were, God has heard your prayer. Decades later, an angel shows up in the oddest scenario and said, God has heard your prayer. See, we can find joy in those tribulations and those trials when we realize that God does in fact hear us. Those prayers are not going into this never-never land. They're not going into voicemail to be put on hold and deleted later. God hears our prayers. We can find joy in knowing that He hears us. Even when we think He's ignoring us, God hears us. And then we can find joy when we know that He answers prayers. Sometimes, decades later. Sometimes quick. But we have a God that hears our prayers and answers our prayer. The angel goes on to say, You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. And last but not least, we can find joy when we know God will use our struggles to his glory. Because it goes on to say that what a difference John the Baptist is going to make in the world. After decades of, of doubt and decades of worry and decades of, of praying, God answered the prayer, but not just in a small way, in a giant way. It said, He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. He will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. See, the prayer that God answered was so much bigger than the prayer they prayed. They prayed for a son. They prayed for a child. But God gave them so much more than their prayer. He honored their faithfulness. He honored them being, unre or being relentlessly praying. That They honored his, their faithfulness by giving them a son that was going to rock the world and prepare the way for Jesus. You know, it's my struggles and my wife's struggles that brought us to where we are today. They brought us to you originally. Because we've seen God move. We've seen God answer prayer. You know, uh, at the funeral, I watched, like seven months later, I watched the funeral. And I, I looked at myself saying this. I pointed to, the, to the, my daughter and I said, life's better changed because of this. Do I remember saying that? Nope. But I said it. It's on video. I said, life's better changed because of this. And I can tell you that it has. See, because I get to bring people my story. I get to bring people the story of what God's done. But here's the thing. This is what I've learned. And this is something that's changed for me dramatically. I can't do this alone. Okay? We can't do these journeys alone. All these trials and tribulations, it's, it's interesting that the church, the one place that we should be open, if we keep that stuff to ourselves, it might make it into an unspoken prayer or a very vague prayer request. But if we journeyed this journey alone, we wouldn't have made it. And you know, honestly, that's why I do what I do now. Because I was a youth pastor for... 15 years before I got into senior ministry. I'm still just a youth pastor in adult clothing, but and I think about all the people that God allowed us to be there for. I was just, I flew from Alaska to Michigan two weeks ago to do a funeral for one of my youth group kids, 19 year old sons. God put me in a place where I was able to be there for that family and be what they needed in that tough, tough, tough situation. And here's my call to you. You can be there too. We know as believers, we know as believers that God is there. 
We know as believers that God hears us, and we know as believers that God answers our prayers. Now, sometimes those answers are no, but He answers every single prayer. But what about those out there that don't know God? What about those people? I mean, we're covered. Yeah, we struggle. But we have God on our side. And I think about, what if Dana and I wouldn't have followed our call? God would have used somebody else, I'm sure. But all the lives in the last 25 years of ministry that have been affected. The one thing about being a youth pastor, is there's no upfront glory to it. You don't get any feedback at all until they grow up and they come back to you and they have kids and your kids, their kids are your youth group kids and you get to hear stories of how their lives change because of one thing you may have done or said in their life. So my challenge to you today is this. Where can you be that joy in someone else's life? Where can you bring God and let them know that he's there through these struggles? Because let's be real. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. I'm sure you can all think of people in your lives. You know, my, my job is uh, specifically, I do this for this reason, because I know that there are people in Alaska that aren't being reached. Now, God's using local people. God's using lay leaders. But I know that there's people in Alaska in, in the villages that have no pastoral figure in a whole village. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? Doesn't that sound crazy? I mean, when you think about that, and you know what? I know that I can make a difference, and I know that you can make a difference. There's a couple ways. One, first of all, right here in your own town, you know, let's look outside the walls of the church. Where do we need to bring God? And you know, another way, I see your missionary board. I see the Ziggle Bowers. You, you support missionaries. But I asked you to consider supporting ministry in Alaska. Not as a church, you can do that as a church also, but as people. There's a guy, his name is Sam Cross. He's a native young man. He lives in Nome. He went to ACC, Alaska Christian College, got his ministry degree. So he's ready to be a village pastor, but no one can afford him. Budgets of $10,000 a year in these churches. So here's a guy that God called. He went to training, and now he's working in a hospital. In a, in a, in, I don't want to say a menial job, but not in a job in his calling or in his training. But you can make a difference, not just in Alaska, but in the world. But specifically, as I talk about Alaska today, you can make a difference by a small donation. You know, if everybody gave $10 a month, there's a new pastor in Alaska. There's people in this hurting world. I mean, I, it's an amazing place. If you've been there, it's an amazing place. But there's also a lot of need. But that's just one thing. You know, I feel the Holy Spirit leads you to do what you're called to do. Um, I'll just say kayak.org, C-Y-A-K. Look it up and see what you can do to make a difference. But most importantly, do something. It doesn't have to be kayak. It doesn't have to be a financial gift. I mean, it can be... You kids hanging out with the neighborhood kids and tell them about Jesus and tell them that God loves you even in all this mess. But do something. Because there's a lot of people just like you as believers that feel forgotten, that haven't had the opportunity to experience God. That haven't had that opportunity. So as I close today, I challenge you, I urge you, if you're listening online and you have not surrender to God. This is your opportunity. But share that with those you care about. Share that with your neighbors. Let them know that there's a God who cares. It's that simple. I mean, it makes us feel so much better to know that God is there and God is covering us in our tough times. And it's simple as saying, you know what? God loves you. God cares about you. There's ways to show it physically. There's ways to show it verbally. And there's ways to show it financially. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in that. Lord Jesus, we just...